Takole, dobrodošli nazaj. Meč, ker nas smo znova izgubili občutek za čas, ampak ta pauza upam, da je bila zelo konstruktivna, da ste izmenjali mnenja in tudi sami mogoče prišli še do kakšnih zaključkov. Nadaljujemo pa z naslednjim govorcem, ki je potreboval kar predvsej časa, da je dejansko uspel priti na seminar, zato smo mu toliko bolj hvaležni. Gre namreč za raziskovalca, ki je diplomiral iz zoologije, je magister biokemije in doktor na področju človeške patologije. Torej, zelo raznovrsten strokovnjak, ki je torej dobil v strani Health Canada certifikat za vodanje laboratorija, ki lahko legalno analizira konopljo, profile kanabinoidov in kemično sestavo. Je avtor številnih študij in člankov v zvezi s konopljo, tako kar se tiče kemične sestave, kot tudi metode ekstrakcije. Veseli smo, da se je odzval po Vabilu in po 26-urnem letu le prišel v Slovenijo, zato ga pozdravimo z velikim aplauzom. Raziskovalec, predsednik podjetja Hedron Analytical iz kanadskega Vancouvra, dr. Paul Hornby. Dobar dan. It is really uh, great to be here in Ljubljana. It's a beautiful city and so historic. And I'd like to thank Bojo for making this all possible for myself. And uh, it's been a real honor to meet Dr. Hanus. Um, I've always considered him to be one of the pioneers and godfathers in all of this, with, along with Raphael Meshulam. Uh, they are the leaders, and I have envied them for years on their ability to research the cannabis plant and do it in a quasi-legal environment. Um, for the past 15 years, up until last year, I was in the lab with my blinds half open, watching for a yellow stripe on a pant leg, which is our federal police force, to come by and take us down. So for many years, I've worked with dispensaries in Vancouver, which allowed me sort of a, a once again, a quasi-legal umbrella to work under. The dispensaries or compassion clubs are, there's roughly 20 of them in Vancouver, the city that I come from, and they dispense cannabis to people in need. And <clears throat> in my talk today, I would like to take you a little bit closer to some of the actual people that I've worked with over the years. I've witnessed many miracles with cannabis medicine, and I'm, I want to discuss a few cases that um, have happened to myself. I, I call what I do high-tech herbal. Uh, in my doctorate training, which was in the mid-1980s, a long time ago, I've often said they made the mistake of sending me to India for a year to, I was working on an oral cancer study. And in India, I saw a lot of people on, who weren't on heart meds or antidepressants. They were using Ayurvedic or herbal medicine and they weren't seeing the side effects that we saw here in North, well, which, that we saw in North America. I was trained in Western science and medical thinking, but India changed my, my attitude. And when I came back, I began to follow people that were producing natural and herbal medicines and seeing effects with them. And then along came cannabis, the big daddy of herbal medicines. It is so profoundly efficacious and useful, uh, it, it really sidelines a lot of the other herbal medicines. This instrument here is what we call high-pressure liquid chromatograph or high-price liquid chromatograph if you're paying for it because they cost around $70,000 new. With this instrument, we identify and quantify the cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. We do eight of them now. We do the THC acid as well as THC that uh, Dr. Hanus went into, cannabidiolic acid, cannab cannabinolic acid, plus the decarboxylated forms here. Um, if I get too technical, throw something at me. I, I, don't, I want to give you an overview of 
of how we measure and um, determine how cannabinoids would be useful in the human body, but I really don't want to get too technical. Um, over the years, well, I run roughly a thousand cannabinoid profiles a year, so 15 years, roughly 15,000 cannabinoid profiles in my data banks. And I want to go into a little bit about what those profiles mean and how we use them to determine the medicine. It was this little bag of tea that got me in trouble years ago. Uh, I had a license to analyze industrial hemp to make sure that it was less than 0.3% THC. And a fellow from a nearby town sent me this little bag of tea and asked if I could measure the THC and CBD in it because he wanted to put it on the market. He had little old ladies coming up to him, giving a hug on the street and thanking him for a good night's sleep. Anyway, I measured the THC in this, and it was less than 0.3%. And he went through a hell of a fight with our local regulatory board called Health Canada. They just wouldn't let him sell this. And I, I didn't know why. It didn't make sense to me because it seemed harmless enough. And uh, anyway, they, they just wouldn't allow it. And my attitude toward medicine has changed over the years. There's only two things that regulatory boards look at when they are allowing a medicine to go on the market. One is it's safe, and two is it efficacious, meaning the desired effect. The good thing about cannabis is that it's never killed anybody. I once read that Louis Pasteur killed off a number of nieces and nephews doing experiments with bacteria. Uh, my family would all be dead now, including the dog, because um, I guinea pig everyone around me, and including myself. And I haven't even been able to make anybody throw up. And the miracles that I've witnessed in people taking cannabis, particularly orally, have been astounding. And uh, I am not, obviously, not a believer in synthetic medicine. And about five years ago, we counted up the number of drugs that the pharmaceutical industry had synthesized around the endocannabinoid system. And five years ago, we, ha we found 150, everything from weight loss to um, anti antidepressants. These are all synthetic compounds, and I personally don't believe that they belong in biological systems, so I've changed my thinking to natural medicines. This is a list of the efficacy of cannabis. It's a huge list. Uh, Dr. Haynes went into why it's so big because of the receptor on, on the central nervous system and its abundance. But to my simple mind, this is, this is why cannabis is illegal because indeed if it was legalized, the pharmaceutical industry would lose its analgesic market, its antidepressant market, its anti-inflammatory market, and they make $500 billion a year profit. That's profit, $500,000 million a year. And last year they spent more money lobbying the U.S. government than any other industry. They make more than any other industry. So they have the power. And this sort of list can be created around people that uh, grow cannabis for petroleum, people that grow it for clothing, people that grow it for food, for seed. They'll all have the same sort of list, like um, Rick was talking about com competition with major industries that developed at the turn of the century. The greatest efficacy for cannabis is pain. For five years, I had my laboratory in a dispensary in Vancouver and witnessed roughly 4,000 people using cannabis therapeutically. And we did a survey, and 80% of those people were using cannabis to manage their chronic pain. And my God, some of these people were busted up. We had people that uh, fell into, <coughs> one fellow that found it, fell into a large turning uh, grain grinder and crushed his pelvis, another that fell 28 feet, the car accidents, on-the-job injuries, 
and trauma leads to chronic pain. And incidentally, someone suffering from chronic pain, which is 24-7 banging drum, they develop what's called chronic pain syndrome. Cycling with that pain is depression and anxiety. If you can't tie your shoes in the morning or go up a flight of stairs, you're not going to communicate with family and friends the same, and it changes your life. So there's mood disorder with chronic pain as well. Fortunately, cannabis treats both. This is the way we measure cannabinoids in any cannabis bud sample. Uh, chromatography is often called separation science because it allows you to identify and quantify compounds in a matrix. I'll go to the next slide, which is typical BC bud where I come from. I've seen that profile thousands of times. The bigger the peak, the more of the compound. This is, get my arrow going here. This is THC acid, by far the most abundant peak. If you burn THC acid in a joint or heat it up in a brownie, it undergoes a process where it loses a carboxyl group and turns into delta 9 THC. This compound doesn't bind the receptor, this one does. If you heat up the sample, this peak will go down to the bottom and will come up over here because the chemical structure has changed. This is cannabidiolic acid and cannabidiol here in very, very small amounts compared to the THC. This is what I call psychoweed <laughs> in BC because indeed if you smoke this, you'll become psychotic. This can go to 25, 30% THC. Temporarily psychotic, if you smoke it chronically, you'll become chronically psychotic. Not to fear folks, um, my definition of psychosis is a very broad one. Everywhere from the tree hugger to the paranoid schizophrenic mass murderer, that's the whole spectrum. The cannabis users that I've witnessed and observed tend to crowd toward the tree hugger area. They tend to be nature loving, dog loving, <laughs> Uh, research-loving people. They're, they tend to be of gentle nature and nonviolent, and that's the psychosis. Now, like I say, I, I run this, I've seen this profile thousands of times, and then <laughs> I'm going to go to skip a couple here. Um, one day a fellow came into the lab and brought in this sample here and I ran it and the first peak to come out was cannabidiol and it kept going up and up and up and I got real excited because I knew I had some valuable medicine here. It was a hippie kid from the island near Vancouver brought this cannabis over and when I started to get excited he started to cry. <laughs> and I haven't to this day asked him why, maybe he was just having a bad day, but I assumed at the time because he knew that we had good medicine here. Because I had, I had never seen this profile before. This is what I call a 50-50 strain. If you add up, like I say, the bigger the peak, the more of the compound there is. If you add up this and you add up the delta 9 and the THC acid, you add the THCs together, it'll equal roughly the same amount of CBD. So this is what I call a a 50-50 or a one-to-one -one strain with equal THC and CBD. Interestingly, interestingly, this strain came to me two days after a lady with a young 14-year-old girl with severe epilepsy was brought to me. And in reading the literature, I had realized that cannabidiol showed some efficacy for treating epilepsy. So. I scoured the d dispensary I was in looking for the highest CBD strain and then this kid brings in this huge CBD strain a couple of days later so it all fit together. Within a day I had had this sample prepped into an oral standardized capsule that mum gave to the 14 year old girl who at that time was having 10 to 16 grand mal epileptic seizures a day, daily, and it was killing her. She was 14, not expected to live past 15. When we gave her this strain, 
She didn't have a seizure for two weeks. They went completely silent. Took her to the hospital. They ran more EEGs on her. Indeed, the seizure, free, the seizure uh, <laughs> frequent. Or they? Huh, what am I looking for? The the seizure the seizure activity has significantly decreased. And last spring, I had the honor of escorting this young lady to her high school graduation. Uh, she's now a young lady and only has seizures once a month when she has her period, no longer daily seizures. So it essentially rubbed out a completely debilitating, uh, terrible epileptic illness called Dravet syndrome. I want to go back to another miracle friend of mine who's become a friend over that same sort of time period. His name is John. John was a fellow that I mentioned fell 28 feet and shattered his body, broke, broke his spine in a number of places, his arm, his leg, everything was shattered. Now he's all wired back together. When I met him, he was full of opiates sitting in a chair, a living dead person. And over the past seven years, John has been through a number of surgeries on bones that it needed uh, repairing. He's come off all of the opiates, only uses cannabis for his pain management, and used cannabis for post-operative operative surgery uh, in both cases. Then he went on to grow a strain that won the Cannabis Cup in Toronto a few years ago, and the next year won it again, with a strain that he developed for his chronic pain. And John is an advocate for many injured workers in Canada. You'll find them on the internet easily. If you type in John Burfello, you'll see him. And he helps people with chronic pain. Uh, there's a fellow who's a friend of John's that I call Metal Man, he packs more metal than any person in Canada holding his bones together. The surgeon told him, you hold the record. Both of these fellows use standardized oral cannabis. And that's Haley there with myself. That was when she was 15, uh, looking good. Now, this is, this is hemp that you grow here in Slovenia. Notice the difference in the CBD and THC. Once again, this is the third profile. This is what I call, well, this is what I call hemp, which is at least 20 to uh, 1 CBD to THC ratio. Now, this particular type of, of profile has taken this young girl that's called Charlotte from before and after. She was suffering 300 gram mal seizures a month, daily once again. Was given that strain with high CBD, once again the seizures ended for about two weeks and they came back in a couple of days and they went away again. Once again, she's seizing sort of once a month. Daily seizures once again eliminated. That's the result of cannabidiol. It's not to do with THC. Haley actually prefers a higher THC strain, but she needs the CBD there so she won't seize. We actually seesawed her seizures by giving her more THC, where she will seize more, more CBD less. So cannabidiol is the key, in my mind, the key cannabinoid in seizure disorder. It's profoundly useful. And I, I actually came here with the notion to <laughs> go over what I call the three-way split. But then Dr. Hainis kind of screwed that up by saying it goes four ways. Um, but he's talking of the fourth way as being low THC and low CBD. If I overlaid the 15,000 chromatograms that I have in my data bank, I would see only these three profiles, high THC, low CBD, like in BC bud, or any recreational pot around the world, it's all that high THC. Or the high CBD, low THC, like in hemp, or the 50-50, 
which is the green one here with the THC and CBD being roughly equal. All three of those profiles have their uses. Psychoweed has its use too, particularly in chronic pain. I don't think I made the point that John was using the high THC, low CBD strain for his pain. He, didn't, he doesn't like Haley's Comet. It doesn't do anything for him. And then I've got, it is written in, in crayon because that other slide didn't come out well, but just emphasize the, the three different profiles that the cannabis plant produces. <laughs> and um, it's impossible to, to change those ratios. I have growers telling me that I've got a 25% THC, 10% CBD plant. I say, no, you don't. They say, yes, I do. I say, how do you know? I say, well, I smoked it. Or I looked, or I looked at the leaf structure. And, uh, but you can't tell that way. The only, I call the chromatography the pudding. That's where the proof is. And um, <laughs> it's frustrating to breeders, but there's no reason, like the hemp sample I showed you is roughly 10% CBD. There's no reason with selective breeding that can't be pushed to 25% CBD and leave the THC where it is at less than 1%. That's the structure of tetrahydrocannabinol. I want to make a point that Dr. Hainus brought up about decarboxylation. I've gone on ad nauseum about this in lectures in BC because we have a lot of baked goods being made there where people will cook brownies or cookies and, or candies, chocolates, and eat them. And in order to get the full effect of THC, you've got to get rid of this arm on the molecule. This is called a carboxyl group. Two oxygens, a hydrogen, there's a carbon atom here. So that's really just CO2. This is the weakest bond on the molecule. So when you heat it up, it vibrates and breaks off. With that arm on there, it can't bind the receptor. You take it off, it can bind the receptor. So decarboxylation is extremely important to understand if you're making baked goods or topicals or suppositories where the THC has to be activated. I won't go on any more about decarboxylation. So. And where the medicine is, is in these balls here. Where my, my arrow? A ball there contains cannabinoids, terpenoids, and really all the medicine of the plant. One way of purifying the medicine from the plant is to shake these off and collect them. In Canada, we call them tumblers. I'm not sure what you call them here, but they're sieves where the, the cannabis is spun around and these, these little blebs are caught in a tray below the sieve. And different sieve sizes will give you different quality of, of trichomes and different uh, type of medicine. And you can actually tell the difference between an indica and a sativa by the structure of these trichomes. Indigas tend to have big balls and sativas have little balls. And just to go on a bit more about the three types of, of cannabinoid profiles, <laughs> I don't want to confuse you by telling you that there are three subspecies of cannabis, sativa, indiga, and ruderalis, but it's only one species. Uh, now, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this by some other molecular geneticists. Um, because they'll, they'll say there's two or three. But I've never met a pot plant that wouldn't mate with another one. A ruderalis will mate with a sativa or, or a, an indiga. And introducing those genetics one to the other is what we call hybridization. If you actually breed a, a ruderalis with a sativa, you can make it go to an auto flower cycle rather than it needing 12 hours light on, 12 hours off, it can, it can flower at any time. So breeding a ruderalis is often done with sativas in order to make a, a different flowering plant. But once again, it's one species, this is what I say, <laughs> um, there's others that agree with me, 
one species tremendously genetically diverse that can interbreed and produce viable offspring, and that is the def classical definition of a species that it can interbreed. So there's type 1, high THC, low CBD, type 2, roughly equal THC and CBD, and type 3, low THC, high CBD. All are very useful uh, medicinally. What makes the difference in the effect is the terpenoids. I've you can have two strains of cannabis with equal amount of THC and CBD, but it will have completely different effects. So it's not about the THC. A lot of it to do with the terpenes that are also contained in those little blebs, which in my mind bring about euphoria and the cannabis experience as we know it. I've taken preps of, I made two preps, one with only THC, the other with THC plus all the other cannabinoids and terpenoids. Equal amounts of THC. Orally, the THC by itself was boring. I'm not in chronic pain, so I didn't get the pain relief. I got a bit hungry, but it was kind of dull. When I took the other equal amount of THC with all the other terpenoids, I got the full cannabis effect. Point is, it's not all about THC. Oh. Chronic pain, oral is better than smoking. If you smoke, oral, smoke and you're in chronic pain, you'll get pain relief here, not here, here, not here, and you'll go through your day in cycling. If you take it orally, you, you, I go on what I call a plateau. It's actually a dome, but you get five hours of pain relief uh, more effectively than you would if you were smoking it. Oh, yeah. I did a radio interview this morning, and uh, a fellow was into drug harm reduction, and we were talking about different types of cannabis products, and I said that in the dispensary I was working in, we used to derail crack cocaine and crystal meth addiction uh, by giving them what we call hippie crack, which is a concentrated form of THC that they would smoke in a crack pipe. They get the same ritual, but then they get a hit of THC and they go and lie down on the couch, but they're not out seeking another crack cocaine or crystal meth hit, so that we, we over time, we can break that addictive cycle. Uh, that's one element of the harm reduction potential of cannabis. A little bit more about oral. There are many different forms, brownies, cookies, capsules that I've been about since day one, standardized, quality controlled cannabis capsules, Rick Simpson type oils, topicals, tinctures. Oh, I didn't say hi to Rick for carrying the message. Good on you, Rick. Uh, juicing, I say controversial because there was a big fad uh, around a year or two ago about juicing cannabis and the health benefits of it. But when we did the experiments on the juicer, this is the juice coming out here, the pulp coming out the back, we found no cannabinoids in the juice. They don't like water. They won't go anywhere near it. They'll do anything they can to get away from it, so they jump into the, the pulp. Um, not to say that that juice is not nutritious. It's chock full of vitamins and minerals, phenolics, flavonoids, anti-cancer uh, compounds like quercetin are in the juice, but the cannabinoids are in the pulp. <laughs> I went to a hemp farm last winter where a farmer didn't get a field harvested in time and it froze. It goes to minus 30 in that part of Canada. And all these hemp plants were about this high, and they're all frozen. And it's just a stalk in a huge bud full of seed. And what the farmer was doing was clipping off the bud and putting them into blenders and making a healthy drink. I can't think of anything that could be better for you than a hemp bud full of seed with cannabinoids in it. It's just a great balancer, full of nutrition. Uh, <laughs> wonderful food. A little bit about publications that I've done over the years. One was on John, the fellow in chronic pain. The other was on a woman with multiple sclerosis. And the third one will be on Haley. Point being that for both John and the woman with MS, 
they had to use 500 milligrams of THC of cannabis per day to maintain their, uh, their pain management. And both required that, both were using 50 milligram caps, uh, uh, and they also used supplements like phenylalanine and tyrosine, which they are free amino acids, again, natural products that they found very useful in relieving their symptoms. This is the synergy of cannabis with other compounds that there, there's no cross-reaction. I've never observed a cross-reaction with cannabis and any pharmaceutical drug, whether it's antidepressant or anxiety drug. It, this doesn't seem to cross-react. Uh, anyway, when I say 500 milligrams of cannabis, of THC as cannabis, that means that it, it's not pure THC. I'm not talking synthetic. I'm talking the natural product where it's got all its brothers and sisters and cousins around, which will modify the effect of THC at the receptor. A bit more on harm reduction. This is a group study we did at a dispensary in Vancouver with a number of people addicted to methadone. We did this study as a simple feasibility observational study to indeed see if there was any effect of all, at all on people that were taking methadone daily and were also using cannabis, mostly in the smokable form, to help um, manage the, the symptoms of methadone. Methadone we call liquid handcuffs on the street in Vancouver because the person who's using it has to go to the clinic every day to pick it up. When they went to the clinic, they came next to the dispensary. So you can set your watch by them. So they were, this is one thing we figured out from the study, they will show up virtually every day. Over three months, we put 11 of them 11 of them on 40 milligram standardized oral cannabis caps and watched the reduction through their prescription records to methadone decrease over time. All of them decreased by roughly 30 to 50 percent. That's the easy part. It's the last 50 percent that's the hard part. And we did get a couple off completely, but you can see the drift downward in the methadone consumption and methadone is attributed to 30% of the painkiller deaths in North America. It's a major killer. Unfortunately, doctors are prescribing it now for pain when it was originally developed as a drug to get people off of heroin. Now, we had a kid in our study that fell off a skateboard and was prescribed it six years ago for pain and now is completely addicted to it. I, I find that a real tragedy and nevertheless cannabis uh, helps people with addicted to opiates and uh, drugs like methadone. Incidentally, it also helps alcoholics. Um, many times we have seen that if you take an oral dose of cannabis after a drinking day, if indeed you remember to take it before bed, you'll wake up with a significantly reduced hangover. No hangover, no desire for the morning drink for the alcoholic in another day of oblivion. It's often the hangover that can bring about another day of drinking. Remove the hangover, you've got a harm reduction uh, agent. Like I say, I've, from day one, I, since running cannabinoids on HPLC and realizing that THC acid was converted to THC, when I first saw that, the first thing I did is measure the amount of THC in a bud sample. Then I wrapped it up in tinfoil, took it to the oven, heated it up for 20 minutes, watched the, delta, the THC have to go down, the delta 9 come up. I finally got it all the way up, and then I ate the sample, and I got the uh, cannabis effect. And I did that with a byproduct of the cannabis plant, not even using the bud, using the trim. And we've made many, many uh, very useful canna caps for research. We call them canna caps for research purposes, just using the trim from the plant, a byproduct. Uh, if indeed you do, I've said that cannabis won't kill you, but 
if you get an overdose of THC, you'll know you're going to die, but you won't. It, it can be one of the most frightening experiences you could ever have. Uh, you can even change your religion. Because a THC overdose will bring about fear, paranoia, I got to get out of here, I'm really scared and I don't know why, but I, I'm going to die. And uh, things that will bring you down from that are simple foods like lemon, uh, if you're overdosing, first try to find someone you trust and feel comfortable with to talk you down. Or you can take a, pine, a handful of pine nuts, uh, calamus root, which is a South Asian herb often used in medicine to treat hallucinations, interestingly, uh, and black pepper. Uh, peppercorns will uh, help calm you down. And don't go to the hospital. I mean, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> because uh, they're not going to be able to help you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what an audience. <laughs> um, you will come down in four or five hours. You'll be back to normal. There'll be no permanent effects from an overdose. You will come down, trust me. Um, and there's nothing they're going to do for you, the hospital anyway, other than scare you more. Anyway, what I sing about these days is full utility of the cannabis plant. Like I mentioned earlier, it has a huge range of efficacy, is extremely useful as a medicine in many parameters, from harm reduction to pain relief to anti-inflammatory. And if we fully utilize the cannabis plant, everything will change. Uh, cotton industry, petroleum, medicine, food. And we have an industrial revolution on our hands. Everything will change, uh, socially, financially. Are we ready for that? <laughs> I, <coughs> I've called the research over the last 15 years the rubber bubble. You push your arm out, it snaps back. You push your leg out, it snaps back because legality is on the other side. In the last six months, I can actually get a license to do the research that I've been doing. And that's really exciting to myself. Uh, finally, we can, we can do this and not get arrested for it. Uh, you've been a great audience. I'm going to close now. I got one more slide that we do offer these analytical services to Europe. Um, just vacuum seal it. That's my email address there. Make contact with me by email first. And you can indeed vacuum seal the sample. We need only half a gram of a bud sample. For a baked good, we need the whole unit to take a weight from. We can analyze oils, tinctures, anything you, that has cannabis in it and tell you exactly how much THC you've got. Uh, whether you fully decarboxylated it, indeed if that's your purpose. Um, and we'll charge a little bit of money to do it, but it might be worth it to you. Um, anyway, thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience, and uh, I do thank you. Hop, hop, Dila. Hvala še enkrat, doktor Jo Polo Hornbijo, ki se mu lahko še enkrat zahvalimo z enim velikim aplauzom za poučne stvari, ki nam jih je povedal v predavanju.